before we uh, get into the manufacturing, let us cover a few things. I want to touch upon these uh, five things that is how does the solar radiation look like, uh, some basics of the solar cells, what are the efficiencies you have on your uh, a maximum power uh, conversion you can get from a cell, then finally a multi-junction cell and then light trapping schemes uh, in, uh, in solar cell. So, first thing to start with, so we need to, why do we need to understand the solar radiation? So, last week we studied display, so you know the thing I emphasize on to understand display was to understand our human vision and our eye response to things and so on. So, to understand solar or really optimize your cell uh, for efficiency, it is very important to understand uh, how does the solar radiation look like. So, plotted here is the irradiance that is you know defined as the energy you get uh, per meter square and I have divided, you can you know divide it into uh, bins of uh, wavelength and this is solar radiation per wavelength, so each of nanometer of these wavelengths. And you could easily measure it, you know, you could have a low pass filter on your light coming in and just integrate it over and measure the spectral uh, irradiance. So, it looks uh, something like this and it looks like uh, this black line is uh, what is called AM0 or that is the radiation, incoming radiation on uh, top of the earth, that is before it hits the earth's atmosphere and this uh, uh, blue or the green ones are what you get on the surface or what you get on top of your roof. So, there are you know there are these uh, few peculiarities to it, one is that it has this uh, shape and then when I compare what is coming uh, hitting the atmosphere, what is coming on top of the atmosphere versus what is reaching on my roof, I see you know certain things are missing, so why are they missing. And what do these numbers AM0, AM1.5, what do they mean? So, why does it look like that? Yeah, so black body radiation has you know a, a spectral response like this. Then why do I have these missing peaks? Why do I have like things missing uh, in between? Yeah, so. Uh, uh, ideal black body radiation would look like this very nice uh, black line which follows this uh, functional form. The sunlight at the top of the atmosphere looks more like this because sun is not an ideal, ideal black body, there are gases inside the sun, so those have peculiar peaks as well. And then when it hits uh, uh, the, our roof, by the time it hits my roof, a lot of it gets absorbed uh, into the atmosphere. And there are these very distinct things missing and each of them corresponds to an elemental peak. So, this one corresponds to the absorption spectra of oxygen. So, all the light at that particular wavelength is absorbed by oxygen and this one corresponds to amount of um, the peaks in the water and especially if you are living in a place like Seattle, you will have a lot of this missing versus if you are living in Nevada, you will still have energy over here, right. So, Overall, it is a black body, it is similar to a black body radiation. It has a very small angular distribution because uh, you know the distance between the sun and earth is so large that the angular distribution is only a quarter of a degree. What I get on top of my uh, atmosphere is uh, 1366 uh, watt per meter square and that is just a number that is quoted uh, uh, very often. There is a company called 1366 as well just because solar startup which is based named off because this number is 1366. And then by the time it uh, reaches uh, my uh, top of my roof, it reduces to uh, around 1000 watts uh, per meter square. And that other number which is uh, AM or I talked about AM 1.5, so that 1.5 corresponds to your angle with respect to your zenith. So, we live in you know northern hemisphere and that uh, 1.5 is essentially corresponds to this angle. So, that is cos inverse of this angle. So, AM 1.5 corresponds to this angle of uh, 48.2 degree that is equivalent to living in Seattle if you compare where that position is on this map. 
and uh, for that 1366 watt per meter square hitting my earth, that number hitting the top of my atmosphere for my AM 1.5 or my air mass of 1.5 that number reduces to around 850 watt per meter square. Typically, you take a number when you send your cell to NREL for, uh, uh, for characterization, they assume a number of 1000 watts per meter square. <coughs> also, another thing which is very important is that you need to track this radiation. So, this radiation or this uh, uh, energy hitting would depend whether it's morning or whether uh, it's you know from 5 a.m. in the morning to uh, 6 p.m. in the night. And if you do nothing to your cell, you know if you leave it just flat, uh, your the amount of radiation hitting would look like this. It's essentially uh, you know uh, just this cost function. And versus if you track your cell and if you follow the position of the sun as it, as it rises in the east and settles in the west, you can get a more uh, better capture of this radiation and you can get a function like this. And uh, this is for a one particular day, but you know it, it would look similar uh, pretty much uh, every day. And this tracking is, it becomes very important, especially when you have higher efficiency cells, because you spend so much and you do not want to. So, you see more and more of this when you make a high efficiency cell and you make expensive cells. So, those mostly leverage tracking, especially all the multi junction or concentrated power cell, they in fact use two axis tracking. They not only track the position of sun, but depending upon what weather it is, it also tells and tracks that as well. So, to turning on to cell basic, right. Most of the people, when you talk to them about solar cells, the picture that comes to their mind is this reverse bias p-n junction, and they assume you know light is falling on a reverse bias p-n junction, and that gives you a solar action. How many people, you know, when you think about solar cell, how many of you relate to that picture? Right. So most of this is you know a fallacy of our educational system is that. Mostly, when people learn about cells, solar cells is you know in their semiconductor physics classes, and they teach, up, teach about p-n junction, and they teach about IV curves, and you know they think that to make a solar cell, you need a p-n junction, and you need you know a reverse bias p-n junction to get energy out of it, and that's a very limited definition. In fact, most of the cells you buy out in the market don't operate on this principle, or they they look nothing like that p-n junction. So. A more, I want to give you a more generic de definition. That a more generic definition of solar cell is that you just need two things. You don't need a p-n junction. All you need is a thing called density of states bottleneck. So you should have, you know, density of states absent in a particular region, and you should have it present above and below it. And you, the second thing you need is selective contact. That's the only thing you need to cause photovoltaic action. You don't need that p-n junction, right? So let me elaborate a more in some more detail on that definition. So, by density of state bottleneck, what I mean is that you should have density of states looking something like this as a function of energy. So, you have a large density of states in a region you can call conduction band, or you know, if you're coming from an organic cell analog, you can call it uh, a homo lumo. And then the you should have a large density of states below a certain energy level, which you call as the valence band. And all you need to have is less density of states here, or no density of states here. If you have a crystalline material, you will have no density of states here. If it is amorphous material or organic material, you will have less density of states here. And this is all that is needed to, you know, one of the requirements that is needed uh, for uh, solar action to happen. The second requirement is that you need selective contact. That is, if you have your uh, these two states, I have bunched them together and drawn it like a conduction and valence band. So, all I need is I need this density of state bottleneck. So, when light hits, I generate this uh, electrons and holes. And all I need is I should have a contact which is selective to holes, and I should have a contact which is selective to electrons. So, I could achieve that in many ways. I could achieve that in a p-n junction. That is the way 
a lot of you thought about it. So, in a p-n junction, I will have these two quasi Fermi levels and I can separate them using this p-n junction. But that is not the only way, you know, I could essentially have two contacts, one being selective to my conduction band and one being more selective uh, to my valence band and I will still get my, uh, I will still get my solar action. I could have very much a structure like this and I will show you an example of a company uh, which produces and makes uh, uh, this cell, it's, it's these cells, uh, these kind of cells are made by Spanio, it is called uh, hit cell or a heterostructure cell and the way this works is you make selective contacts by growing another layer over here which has a band line up like this and growing another layer which has a band line up like this. So, this contact now becomes selective to electron and this contacts now becomes selective to hole and again you get solar action. So, the only two requirements that I want to emphasize is that you need a density of state bottleneck and you need a selective uh, contact. So, you need to have a contact which you know is, is transparent to electrons and blocks it for holes, you need to have a contact which is, uh, which blocks it for electrons and is selective uh, for, uh, is uh, transparent for holes. The problem is most, so this what requirement it brings is that if I define my contacts in terms of uh, selective recombination velocity, my surface recombination velocity for electrons should be infinite here. It should be 0 for holes over here. On the other contact which is selective to holes, this should be infinite over here and 0 for electrons over there. Most ohmic contacts do not work like that. So, most ohmic contacts are selective to both electrons and holes. So, that is why you know you some people engineer a junction to make it selective, uh, but uh, this is a limitation that you do not ohmic contacts by default do not do it. So, that is why many a times people need to make a p-n junction or they need to introduce that heterostructure to do this, but this is more of a limitation of ohmic contacts and not a limitation of solar uh, photovoltaic action. <coughs> so, now you know I have emphasized that you need a density of state uh, bottleneck and you need selective contacts and if you do that you uh, the IV characteristics of your cell looks something like this. So, if you uh, because of that photovoltaic action you have this current in your uh, fourth quadrant and when you uh, extract uh, at a voltage over here you get say this much amount of current and uh, uh, the main uh, few of the important defining factors or the few of the important defining parameters are this uh, short circuit uh, current and open circuit uh, voltage. So, open circuit voltage uh, would be the voltage when you have zero current and short circuit uh, current would be essentially this thing. And then you have a thing called fill factor which determines the area of this shaded rectangle versus area of this larger rectangle. And I am sure you know you some of um, this, this is covered in a you know a basic uh, semiconductor class. But assuming this, what is the maximum efficiency I can get out of, uh, the question I want to emphasize here is that what is the maximum efficiency I can get out of a single one material crystalline uh, solar cell uh, given that you know I have this kind of an operation. And to simplify things, I will assume that the maximum uh, open circuit voltage that I can get is the band gap of my material. And usually whenever uh, you operate a cell, your band gap is always less, your open circuit voltage is always less than the band gap because your band gap is the maximum voltage you can, you know, you can have separating your uh, electrons and holes. But I will just for, you know, simplifying the calculation, I will assume that. And I will also assume a fill factor of 1. This is again, you know, um, uh, simplifying things, but these turns out this is actually the case when you go to 0 Kelvin. You get uh, all your defects freeze out and you do get a voltage, uh, open circuit voltage uh, equivalent to your band gap. <coughs> so, then, you know, what is my efficiency? So, my efficiency I defined as this. So, this is essentially the my short circuit current into my open circuit voltage into my fill factor divided my incoming power and now I have assumed my uh, 
my open circuit voltage to be equal to my band gap. I have also simplified and assume a fill factor of 1. So, what is the maximum efficiency I can get out of a single material uh, solar cell? So, all I need to do is integrate my incoming power and incoming and integrate my outgoing uh, you know my uh, maximum I can absorb out of it. So, my incoming power is, is more simple to integrate. So, I can just take my black bodies assume my sun is to be a black body again I am simplifying things and then my black body radiation is given by this fourth power of the temperature of the sun and then I get it only at that 40 very small uh, quarter degree of an angle and I can integrate that and I can get my uh, incoming power and uh, you know this will come out to be 100 uh, milliwatt per centimeter square and uh, or you know equivalent to that same thing 1000 watt per uh, 1000 watt per meter square. And then what I need to do is that how much energy can I get out of it. So, I need to integrate my solar spectrum over my band gap and essentially what will happen is that whenever I will have light coming in. Uh, for a given uh, energy, if it is higher than the energy of my band gap, then I will lose that energy as uh, thermalization, because I can only extract these carriers will thermalize before I extract them. Although there are some people who are trying to extract these hot electrons as a way to increase the efficiency of your solar cell, but assuming you know that technology is not out there at the moment, these carriers will thermalize and you can you lose that extra energy especially if if the energy is less than my band gap of that material I will lose the photon as well I will not be able to absorb it at all. So, I need to integrate that uh, uh, my solar irradiance over my band gap. So, whatever is above my band gap is essentially a step function whatever is above my band gap is extracted at band gap whatever is below my band gap is just lost. So, if I integrate it over it looks like this. So, it looks like you know if you have a band very small band gap you will absorb all of it, but you will absorb everything at a lower band gap. So, your efficiency would be low. If you have a very high band gap you will absorb uh, a limited part of your spectrum at that high band gap, but you will lose a majority of it. So, again it is low, but uh, it peaks out you know to be around uh, 50 percent and I have assumed that internal quantum efficiency that is for each photon you are generating uh, one electron hole pair, then I have also assumed that every time you generate that electron hole pair you are able to extract it. I have this calculation is done using a AM 1.5 uh, radiation and uh, you will do this in your homework uh, problem set 3 as well, but what is wrong with this? What is wrong? I mean I, I you know for sure that you do not get 50 percent efficiency with one uh, one material solar cell right. So, what is wrong? So, the prime thing that I uh, missed is that I assume that you know for every photon that you know I absorb I essentially converted into uh, you know into these electron hairs pairs, but by default this is a reversible phenomena. So, the main thing that I missed was you know if I have these electron hole pairs they will recombine and generate backlight as well. So, this radiative recombination is uh, the term that I missed and if I take that into account uh, a very uh, um, well known formula for uh, the efficiency of uh, uh, both uh, uh, single junction and multi junction uh, solar cell is called this uh, Shockley uh, Quasier limit. It was derived by Shockley and one of his protege uh, Quasier all the way back in 1960s. And uh, if you take that uh, radiative component uh, into account, uh, what you get is that that number falls from uh, 50 to it falls to around uh, 32 percent, and that's uh, what you get maximum from. Uh, a single material uh, solar cell and uh, it is a fairly broad peak between uh, band gap of 1.1 to 1.4. So, silicon uh, fortuitously is, is you know right where that peak of that uh, uh, 
uh, peak of that efficiency is. And you know that efficiency would be fairly constant from silicon to gallium arsenide. And uh, because since it is a pretty broad uh, peak. So, uh, how, how do I do better? So, the way I can do better is you know uh, do uh, multi junction. So, what I could do is have instead of being handicapped or being handcuffed by just having one band gap, I could uh, line up uh, my cells uh, like this. So, I could either have two of these materials conducted in series and many a times the way to do that would you grow the one material on top of each other. But that is not the only way, I could do it like this as well. I could essentially you know have just two different cells setting side by side and I could split my light using a prism and pass the individual light to each of these solar cells. And there is a big DARPA program which does that, which is trying to do that, but the problem there is optimizing the you know efficiency of this prism and this light splitting. But if I do it like this, like if I uh, do it like this, that I combine this uh, two band gap materials, and it's always com it's always ordered in this way. The high band gap material is always on the top, because if the low band gap material is on the top, it will you know absorb everything and not pass anything to the high band gap material. So this high band gap material is always uh, facing the sunlight, and. Uh, so, Mr. Shockley and Mr. Coizier, you know, they were prescient enough to, to detect this back in 1960s and they derived a limit for this as well. So, what essentially they derived was that if you have uh, instead of having one band gap material, now you have two of these band gaps. So, something of a band gap of say 1.7 and this is like a gallium phosphide band gap and then you have something which is a band gap of 1 or could be silicon. So, each of these would be you know uh, uh, this would this red one would completely take out this area and then whatever is left would be taken out by this uh, other material. And uh, if you have a three material system you can essentially fit three of those rectangles into this uh, curve. If you have a four material system you can fit four, you can go crazy and try to you know fit uh, even more than that. The more practical ones currently are around 4 and 5, they try to fit 4 and 5 material systems into uh, grown on top of each other to maximize this efficiency. And Mr. Shockley and Mr. Collier again you know they derived this for us, they ruined it for all the other theoretical physicists and derived everything back in 1960 and for one cell you get 32 percent, for two cell you get 42 percent, three cell you know you get 48 percent if you have infinite cells you get 86 percent, but there are other limits you cannot get 86 percent actually even if you have multiple infinite numbers of cells and there are some other limits which come into play. There is a, a, a limit called Landsberg limit which essentially comes from uh, thermodynamics, but you know uh, even more simple limit is what you will call a Carnot cycle limit. So, you know our solar cell we assume it will operate at 300 uh, Kelvin and our sun is at uh, 6000 or 5000 uh, some Kelvin. So, the maximum efficiency would be 1 minus the temperature of your cell divided by the temperature of the sun that is the Carnot engine efficiency. So, anyway you cannot go more than 95 percent. A more practical limit which comes from thermodynamics is you know this is called the Landberg's limit and it essentially has that same formula temperature of your uh, cell versus the temperature of your sun, but it has this extra term which comes from this all this heat exchanges uh, analysis because you will have uh, this heat reservoir in this medium and so on. So, a more practical not a more practical a more, a more fundamental limit uh, even if you had infinite numbers of these layers stacking up it is 93 percent. And uh, one of the options you have for doing your project is you know studying more on these uh, limits. 